Today we're going to explore what is maybe one of the most complex ways to find the area of a region in the plane. And we'll show why this works, as well as work out some example where we find the area of a circle using this method. So in order to do all this, we're going to need some derivative operators that operate on functions with complex variables. So the first is sometimes called the partial derivative with respect to z, and it's defined to be 1 half the partial derivative with respect to x minus i partial derivative with respect to y, where you view a function of a complex variable, which is generally called z, as being a function of two real variables x and y, x being the real part of z and y being the imaginary part of z. So this is this duality between multivariable calculus and single variable complex calculus. Okay, so anyway, we also have another partial derivative, which is now with respect to z bar, the conjugate of z, which is defined to be half the partial with respect to x plus i times the partial with respect to y. So looking at these, if you know anything about how you decompose a complex number into real and imaginary parts and then take its conjugate, it may seem like these are switched, but we're about to show you why they are not switched. So let's do that by taking the partial derivative of z with respect to z, and then the partial derivative of um, z with respect to z bar, and so on and so forth, just to show that this is kind of the right definition for these operators. Okay, so that gives us one half the partial with respect to x minus i times the partial with respect to y, and that is going to evaluate on x plus i y. Okay. So notice we need to like foil this out. Well, really the foiling is an evaluation, not really a multiplication, but we use the same sort of strategy. So this partial with respect to x needs to act on x and i, y. Luckily for us, acting on i, y gives us zero. So all we need to consider is the acting on x. Similarly, this partial with respect to y needs to operate on x and i, y, but operating on x gives us zero, so we only need to worry about that one operating on y. Okay, so let's see what we get. Now we have a half, and then the partial with respect to x of x is one, and then we have minus i times the partial with respect to y of i, y, but that gives us i, but now we have minus i times i, but since i squares to negative 1, this is really 1 minus negative 1 or 2, so here we get the number 1. And that makes sense because the partial with respect to z of z should be the number 1. Okay, let's work out another one of these. So let's take the partial with respect to z bar of z. So that'll give us a half the partial with respect to x plus i times the partial with respect to y of x plus i y. Great. We're, now I have a different derivative operator because I'm taking the derivative with respect to z bar. Okay, now we can do the same kind of thing. This partial with respect to x need only apply to this, part, this variable x, and then this partial with respect to y need only apply to the variable y. So in the end, we'll have a half, and then the blue evaluation gives us 1, and then the green evaluation gives us i squared when all is said and done. So we have 1 plus i squared, but that's clearly equal to 0. So this shows us some sort of deep independence, I should say, between z and z bar. So if you're thinking about this in multivariable calculus, like we did here, the partial of y with respect to x is 0 because x and y are independent of each other. Well, here z and z bar are independent of each other. Okay, so let's maybe do one more. Let's take the partial with respect to z bar of z bar to round all of this out. So that's going to be a half, and then we have the partial with respect to x plus i times the partial with respect to y of x minus i y x minus i, y is z bar. Okay, so now this partial with respect to x will operate on the x and give us something non-trivial, and this partial with respect to y will operate on the i, y and give us something non-trivial. And notice in the end, we have 1 half and then 1 minus i squared. 
but one minus i squared is two, so we get one half times two, which is one again. And that makes sense. The partial with respect to z bar of z bar really should be one. Okay, so I think I've motivated these definitions for these differentials, and now we'll jump into a calculation of area using this complex Green's theorem. But maybe before we do that, I'd like to point out that I've got a second channel where I do a bunch of course videos and stuff like that. And I've actually got a whole course on complex analysis, including a proof of this complex Green's theorem if you're interested in seeing the details of how this is arrived at. Okay, now we're ready to get our area formula using this complex Green's theorem. So let's notice that the area of some region D so in multivariable calculus, that would just be the double integral over d, dA, so our differential area component. But now let's sneak a number one in here, and we'll see that this is the double integral over d of the partial of z bar with respect to z bar dA. So something that looks like that. Okay, but now let's notice that that z bar is playing the role of f. So in fact, we can apply this complex Green's theorem to rewrite this as 1 over 2i, and then the integral over the boundary of d of our function f in this case, which is z bar dz. So that's our nice area formula, like in general, for a region that can be expressed in the complex plane. So the area of the region d is one over two pi, and then the integral over the boundary of z bar. Okay, so now let's calculate the area of a circle of radius r doing this. So here what we have, area circle radius r, so let's maybe put that in a box, will be equal to one over two i times the integral over all complex numbers z where the modulus of z is equal to r. Notice that that will definitely give us a circle just because the modulus of a complex number is the distance from the origin. So it's got points like r and then r times i and then minus r times i on it and so on and so forth. Now we have z bar dz. Okay, next up we need to think about how to parameterize this circle, but there's a standard way to parameterize circles using Euler's complex exponential function, so that's nice. We can say that z is equal to r times e to the i theta, where theta runs from 0 to 2 pi. So that parameterizes our circle counterclockwise, which is the direction we want it to be parameterized. Okay, but now if z is equal to that, z bar is equal to r e to the minus i theta. So you can check that by expanding this as cosine theta plus i sine theta, and then using the fact that cosine is even and sine is odd. Then we need one more thing. We need our differential z component. So dz will be i r e to the i theta d theta. Okay, so now let's put all of that in there. We have one over two pi, and then the integral from zero to two pi. So z bar is r e to the minus i theta, and then dz is i times r e to the i theta d theta. Now let's notice some stuff cancels. So this e to the minus i theta cancels with this e to the i theta, and then this i in the numerator cancels with this i, and we're left with one half times r squared. Well, that's a constant, so we can bring it out. So really, r squared over two, and then the integral from zero to two pi d theta. But that's just gonna give us two pi. That two pi will cancel with the two, just giving us pi, leaving us in the end with pi r squared. Okay, so in the end, this is kind of a simple way to calculate the area of a circle, but it uses a lot of nice machinery that really shows us the beauty of this mathematics in general and complex analysis in particular. Okay, that's a good place to stop.